Hello, everybody. Great to hear. Great to hear so many people have come to join this wonderful webinar. It's our first webinar of 2020, uh, brought to you, of course, by the Streaming Video Alliance. This webinar is going to be securing live streams, and we have an excellent panel lined up uh, with people from you know, a, a wide range of organizations involved in the security of streaming video. Just a few housekeeping things. My name is Jason Tebow. I'll be your moderator today. Uh, I am the executive director of the Streaming Video Alliance. If you're curious about that organization or you don't understand what we do, please visit our website, which the URL is at the bottom of the slide. And in terms of what happens next, this will be recorded. So of course, if you have colleagues who are unable to attend or you want to re-listen to it, uh, you know, some information that you didn't capture, you know, it will be available on the Streaming Video Alliance website. Uh, and you'll also receive an email from uh, go to webinar, uh, which is our webinar organizer, uh, with a link to that video. So no problem. You know, at the end of this all, don't don't waste time taking notes. Uh, you can obviously come back and listen uh, as many times as you would like. All right. Now, in order to kick off our discussion, uh, what I'd like to do is go through the panelists and have them introduce themselves, and then after that, we'll jump into our discussion. And again, we've got a lot of really great questions. Uh, for our panelists to answer. It looks like right now that we're missing Marvin from FriendMTS, so hopefully he'll join in a little while. Uh, but if not, we've still got some really great uh, experienced people want to talk about stream security. So let's start with uh, Kay. Go ahead, introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Kay Fu. I work for Charter Communications in the Video Delivering Engineering Group with the focus of content protection as, you know, the focus for my day-to-day -day job. and I've been in this role for about three years now. Pete? And hi everybody. Uh, yeah, I think is Marvin Marvin on now or Mar Marvin is on now. So let's. Uh, yeah, Marvin, can you hear us? Okay, go ahead, um, Peter. Go ahead, and we'll have Marvin introduce himself at the end. Great. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Kosak. I am the Vice President of Cybersecurity Services for Erdetto. Um, I look after content protection and anti-piracy services uh, globally. Um, yeah, and thanks for having me. Fantastic. Thanks, Pete. And then lastly, we've got uh, Orly from Cinemedia. Hi, um, I'm Orly. I'm Salem from Cinemedia. I'm a product manager responsible for anti-piracy and security portfolio. Uh, we are seeing a media, we are helping TV operators, telcos, and media companies to um, deliver, protect, and monetize their content. That's fantastic, thank you so much. All right, so again, it looks like Marvin had a connection issue, so it's, he just joined again. Marvin, are you there? I see him and his microphone is green. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Marvin. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi. 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 This is Marvin Nuts-Colpec. I'm a uh, solution architect at FriendMTS. I focus on the um, OTT streaming um, area and the uh, clients that, uh, that are um, that, uh, involved in streaming. So, Hi. Fantastic. Glad to have you, Marvin. Yeah, so again, great panelists, uh, you know, for this kind of discussion. So let's, let's kick it off. Let's actually start with something a little high level uh, and really just to get a sense of, you know, what's going on uh, in the industry. Obviously, we, the industry talks a lot about piracy uh, and we talk a lot about stream theft. So, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe, uh, Peter, maybe you can, uh, you can start us off with this, but how prevalent is live stream theft? And I've heard it called, you know, sort of stream leakage. Um, is it really as big a problem as, as everyone's making it out to be? And, you know, how, how, do, how can we even measure, you know, the impact of that theft? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I, I think um, you know one of the stats that I that I look at and that we kind of measure is using web traffic statistics um, from similar web. One of the key kind of uh, data points that we see is um, there's essentially uh, based on the reporting that that we're seeing and what they're saying is there's about 260 million visits per month. Um, that's that's people going to each one of these sites for the top four streaming video sites. Um, I mean, that's a significant number. And there's about 9 million unique um, users who go to these sites on a monthly basis 
on average. So yeah, it's very prevalent. Um, the issue is growing. I think as we see kind of the streaming wars going on and, and um, people looking to obtain content in one location and not paying, you know, a multitude of different subscriptions, I think the, the problem is actually going to get bigger um, as we move forward. And then Orly and Marvin, you know, what are you guys seeing from your perspective? I mean, obviously, like, uh, you know, like uh, Peter Dardetto, I'm, I'm sure you guys are keeping a bead on, you know, sort of what's happening in the industry. Are you seeing things similar to, to what he was talking about? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yes. So, uh, um, oh. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, the big impact um, we see is on live sports because, uh, you know, uh, this being a, a live streaming uh, di discussion, um, the, the sort of last bastion of, of live TV really is uh, is live sports, high value live sports that you get um, exclusively on, on pay TV stations. So um, there's certainly a, a, a lot of um, a lot of buzz around uh, around people being able to access um, those sports for free. And if you look at the um, uh, at, at the forums, at the Discord um, uh, chat groups, at, uh, uh, um, at Reddit, um, you'll see that there's a lot of demand for um, uh, for illegal live streams, especially of, of high value sports content. So it certainly it certainly is a, a prevalent um, problem. And um, it's it's uh, there's a huge demand for uh, illegal live um, streams, um, especially of sports. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I agree with what was said and I would like to add something. So um, it's not just about streaming uh, or streams leakage or theft. It's also about um, credential sharing and fraud that is impacting the revenues of the content owners and ser service providers. And this is something that is getting more prevalent as well. Um, whether it's casual sharing, you know, people that are sharing with their their the credentials for the video service with their family and friends, or um, credentials that are um, ending up in the wrong hands as a result of uh, a product, some fraud activity. Um, latest research by Hub Entertainment uh, reveals that uh, nearly half of the users um, that they uh, participated in their survey actually said that they are using someone else's credentials or giving their credentials to someone else. So there's a, the service provider, the pay TV industry is going to pay a lot of it in terms of revenue. And of course the impact can be measured um, as was said here by you know measuring the web traffic, but also behavior analytics, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence also help us to understand the, the impact of the problem. Oh, I mean, and that's, that seems, you know, so it seems like there is you know, not only a lot of theft happening, but um, obviously, there are let's call them innovative ways that bad actors are, in fact, you know, stealing things, right? So, so if, like Marvin said, there is such a huge demand for live sports, and you know, some people are not willing to pay the price to see them streamed, and they will go to a, you know, pirate site to watch that stream pirated. Uh, you know, obviously, all the the rights holders and the distributors are doing things to prevent that. But what are some of the ways? You know that that you know and maybe um, you know maybe Orly actually maybe you can you can start us out with this and sort of continue on what you were just talking about with credential sharing. But what are some of the common and maybe not so common ways uh, that pirates do steal content and redistribute it for you know for their own profit? Mm -hmm. So um, we at Cinemedia we are focusing on two types of of content stealing um, or illegal access to to the actual service. So the first one is, is actually when pirates are connecting to the service as, as legit subscribers uh, with some very easy and very not sophisticated steps. They Through HDMI output, they can actually get the content, the clear content, and then redistribute it either to um, open websites uh, where their revenue model will be um, you know, by, by putting lots of ads um, on that website, or they can redistribute it to um, their own subscription-based uh, private pirate network. Um, and, and this gives actually the piracy viewers the access to the content they would like to watch. Uh, usually those services are aggregating so much content, like thousands of channels, lots of VODs and so on, and, and those are really attractive. Um, the second way that actually streams or you know the actual access to the service can be 
stolen or, or um, as by uh, credential sharing and, and, and fraud, where credentials are shared or stolen, either you know family and friends uh, that are sharing between them or credentials that can be bought on marketplaces, dark web, or even sometimes on legit e-commerce platforms for like tenth of the price of the legit service. Uh, we also see cases where people are swapping credentials. You know, you'll give me um, access to this uh, service and I'll give you uh, my credential for another service. Um, and, and this is very easy probably, uh, to, to do, and it's very prevalent among you know younger generation, but not not just. Great, and 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 let's say you know Peter, um, you know what are some of the ways that you know that Erdeto sees people, uh, or sorry again, bad actors, uh, you know, stealing content for redistribution. Yeah, sure. I think just adding on to what Orly said, I think she hit a few of them. But I mean, we're still seeing some of the old school ways, right, where they're they're setting up a set top box and, and redistributing that. Um, and, you know, we do see that not everybody is using uh, digital rights management. So, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of theft from CDNs, um, from from devices. Um, so I, I think, you know, pirates typically will go down the path of least resistance so they'll they'll kind of fish around and search until they find um the easiest way to you know to, to pull and rip that content and then redistribute that content and, and marvin are you guys seeing you know specific uh techniques or mechanisms that are being used at, at friend mts yep so uh like uh, peter said uh the uh, pilots will follow the the path of least resistance and um the more good work that we do at, at organizations like the s v a to uh, make uh, high quality live streams available to, um, to people with low latency and excellent quality um the uh, on o t t devices uh pilots will flock to that uh, so uh, whereas traditionally again like peter said they they'd have farms of uh, of set up boxes in um, in a in a room somewhere to and, and capture from that and redistribute from that um, now they can use ott devices as well um, and the, the quality is just as good um, but the uh, like previous um, uh, panelists have said there is a lot of, uh, of 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 content theft simply directly from operators so uh, the, there's a lot of, we see many many cases on a day-to-day -day basis where uh, uh, content owners and and uh, uh, streaming platforms have simply not taken care of the basics like drm uh, GOIP protection and uh, and really uh, uh, poorly implemented uh, uh, AES based uh, HLS teams and um, there, there there are lots of simple ways that that pirates steal content. Um, in terms of the um, the rebroadcasting, uh, you know we we do see people using um, CDNs, uh, so people use Cloudflare, people use uh, use other CDN um, services. Uh, uh, Provided by uh, by hosting providers that um, pro offer their services to illegal um, um, rebroadcasters like this, uh, but also we see at the low end of the spectrum or, or at the non-professional end of the spectrum, people will use things like uh, Twitch and YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, etc., uh, to rebroadcast content. But like I said, those won't be your professional uh, pirates. No, no, yeah, that there's makes no sense. honor <laughs> among things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that the isn't that the truth? Um, and actually, that Marvin, that's a really great segue into you know kind of our next question, which um, you know, Kay, if you can sort of lead us off on this one, you know, obviously, you know, we have three folks on the panel that are from you know technology vendors in the security space, right? So obviously, there's a lot of stuff being developed, a lot of technologies, a lot of innovative approaches being developed to stop exactly what you know marvin pete norley just talked about the different and myriad different ways uh, that pirates are, are are stealing content and so you know Kay, are, are there can you talk a little bit about you know some of the technologies that um you know coming from your perspective you know as a network operator that um you know content owners and distributors can employ to prevent stream theft and you know are there even things you know additional steps and in, in, including using technologies that distributors can um you know can take with things like you know network configuration or you know cache configuration or things like that yeah so to, to answer this question i think it's important to preface that it is very unlikely that we can prevent all content or stream theft however i think it is reasonable to make it more challenging for someone to steal content 
And like many on the panel have just said, you know, content is too easily stolen directly from the programmer's own distribution system and also from, you know, the distributor's set-top boxes. So some of the most effective technologies that we can employ today are really just like user and device authentication to limit the fraudulent password sharing that Orly just mentioned. And then, you know, proper implementation of DRM um, to secure IP stream that Marvin has mentioned. And then equally important, at least from our point of view, is that, you know, the network security, such as secure protocol being used whenever possible is also important because even though secure protocols are usually used just to keep the network communication private, um, it is still a good measure to implement. And at Charter, we have also partnered with um, security vendors to monitor illicit streaming online and to issue takedown notices for Charter's um, specific live sport content like the Dodgers and also the Charter's um, original contents like Mad About You that was released in December. So that's kind of the things that from a distributor point of view can do and that's kind of where yeah, we are currently. Yeah, that, that's you know, obviously that's really interesting. So let, let's sort of go down the line because obviously, um, you know, the three different vendors will have three different, you know, answers to this question. But Marvin, so talk a little bit from your perspective about, you know, what friend MTS, what, what is the technology that you guys see that content owners can use most effectively? Yeah, so ultimately, uh, once a content owner and um, their, uh, the, their distribution partners have implemented all of the correct things like DRM, like uh, um, the CDN level protection, tokenization, etc. Once once all of those pieces are in place, um, then the, really the pilot is left with one option to get the content to, uh, out of your um, your service, and that is to steal it um, from uh, a, a a a subscription, a legitimate subscription. So at some point they have to pay you uh, in order to steal the scheme to to then redistribute. So the only effective way that you can really um, uh, stop them from uh, redistributing their content is by having some sort of, of, of identifier within the stream that they've stolen um, that uniquely identifies that uh, uh, the subscriber so that you can then take action, uh, remedial action or immediate action to, to terminate that um, illegal re-steaming operation. Uh, so um, one of the ways that you can do that is obviously through, uh, through watermarking. Um, and that is, uh, is something that we, we promote heavily. So ultimately, if you've done everything um, that you need to do um, in order to protect your content, uh, the only way you can, you can stop uh, it from being rebroadcast is by identifying it securely and ensuring that you can take down an illegal stream at the source. Oh, that makes, uh, obviously that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, again, at the SBA, we have uh, explored you know, forensic watermarking, for example, as a technology that can be used in, uh, you know, in stream identification and takedown. Uh, Peter, what, what, what are your thoughts from Erudetto's perspective? What technology, you know, are you guys really thinking is, is you know, critical or crucial to, to stream protection? Yeah, I mean, it all starts with, with the DRM, right, and having a, a rights management system in place for or multi-DRM. Um, cause that, that kind of deters and, and, you know, like, like, uh, Kay was saying, it, it starts with that and it kind of helps deter the pirates and it, it makes it a little bit harder for them to just kind of pluck and, and place and rebroadcast that stream. So it starts with DRM and then it, it having a, a full 360 degree view on piracy. So it starts with DRM, then it goes to forensic watermarking so you can identify the stream and where it's coming from. And then having, you know, uh, an online piracy or an anti-piracy uh, team who's able to discover that. And, you know, because in live, your speed is the name of the game. So the quicker that you can kind of address those streams. And if you can have, you know, all of your security integrated into um, into one workflow, it makes it much quicker, faster to kind of address, um, you know, in real time, these live streams when they're being rebroadcast and get them taken down. You know, so it's it is having that holistic view from a security standpoint, have a strategy in place that that kind of takes advantages of all the technology that's available out there in the market. Uh, absolutely. And then and then Orly, obviously, Cinema Media is doing, you know, some very innovative stuff as well and coming at it almost maybe from a little bit different perspective. What what are your thoughts on, you know, sort of, the, again, the technologies that the content owners might be able to use when partnering with somebody like Cinema Media? Mm -hmm. So there's prevention uh, and there's detect and disrupt streaming piracy. And as 
uh, was said here that uh, preventing is up to a certain level and then you just need to be fast enough in order to detect and disrupt. Um, and, um, you know, pirates are smart. You put locks on the doors, they will try to get through the window. So you need to make sure that you're detecting this and there is, and, and you should have de detect and disrupt solutions that, um, um, actually can help you to frustrate, um, piracy viewers and encourage them eventually to consider returning back, um, to the legit service. And this is actually what we are trying to focus at. Um, and regarding network um, level solutions, so like IP blocking, for example, these are great. Um, and this is also something that we are uh, now employing, in, but you need to make sure that you have a really good technology to actually identify, to detect those pirate services in order to do this disruption. Yeah, that makes total sense. And, and let me let me go back to, to Kay a little bit. So it's it's interesting hearing all of you talk about you know, approaches to preventing stream theft or, or content theft. Now, I think obviously, right, there, I get a sense that there is some feeling maybe from the content just owners and the video distributors of sort of, you know, an acceptable loss, right? I don't want 15% of people stealing my content, but I'm willing to live with, you know, 2%. Um, so it's, it's very interesting from a business perspective, but the technologies you guys all talked about, you know, they seem to all work together uh, in some way. And so it's okay, again, you know, coming from, you know, a different perspective than a technology vendor, you know, how does, you know, how does Charter, you know, look at sort of the security technology stack? You know, is there a stack for stream security? And, and or, or is it really just sort of like, if I have this one technology, I'm, I'm good to go and I shouldn't worry about anything else? So, yeah, so I, I think technology stack, it, it, it is a good way to look at it um, for stream security because generally any good security practices would also be good for um, stream security like authenticating the user with login credentials and using DRM to protect your content stream. And from a distributor point of view, obviously we also have, um, you know, contractual agreements between programmers and distributors. So then depending on the requirements there, um, there would be multiple technologies that we would need to use to secure a video stream. And as everyone has mentioned here, you know, the, the video piracy has gotten pretty sophisticated. Um, so I think a content strategy needs to be a multi-pronged approach. So it, it's most likely you'll need more than one. And, you know, so the same thing with user login credential and, and DRM that's already true that you're using. And then anything else that you can add on top of that um, would just make it more challenging for pirates to get in. Anybody want to add to that? I mean, Peter, do you do you agree that you know that's kind of a, a good approach or a solid approach, or, or do you have any you know thoughts to add? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's a great approach. I think um, you you have to understand what's going on because the landscape's constantly changing. So. You know, having things like concurrent stream management, having DRM, having watermarking, these are all tools that can be used for any um, content owner or distributor to really combat piracy, right? And and like Kay said, you're never going to stop at 100%, but if you can frustrate them or you can limit kind of the damage that's done or the risk, um, I think it's really important. I think, you know, there's technology out there. I mean, forensic watermarking and OTT watermarking will, will give a distributor or a content owner the ability to shut down streams in real time. Um, I mean, that's a fantastic tool to use. I think we're seeing, you know, uh, CDNs and, and ISPs start to kind of take a, a larger role in, in the anti-piracy world. And I think, you know, when you put all this together and you have a, a multi-pronged approach and a strategy in place, it can really have the effect that you're, you're really wanting to have. Oh, and that, that, that's great. And, and Marvin, you know, what about from friend NPS perspective, right? So some of the engagements you guys work with, some of the video distributors and the content owners, you know, are you working with other vendors as well to create sort of a consolidated strategy for your customers? 
Yeah, so um, I think uh, most of the other technology vendors here will also be working with people like YouTube and Facebook um, who have their own uh, content identification and, and uh, stream protection, um, uh, content rights protection uh, mechanisms in place. And it's important to, to, to use those kinds of partnerships where possible um, to, to maximize your ability to, to take down uh, those uh, illegal streams where, wherever they occur. And uh, yeah, certainly they, um, you know, the, they are, they, they, you need to use the best uh, tools uh, for each category of, of, uh, um, uh, of the technology stack. So um, you need to use the best possible DRM, you need to use the best possible um, uh, watermarking, and you need to use the, 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 the best possible uh, um, concurrency management and other um, uh, tools for, for managing um, uh, sessions. So yeah, um, it's, it's, it's important to, um, uh, to, 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 to leverage um, all of the, 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 the data and the services that you have at your disposal in order to, to, to produce that kind of holistic picture of the, of the security landscape. Perfect. And Orly, do you have anything to add to that as well? Um, I, I agree. It takes, um, it takes uh, you know, a few parties joining together in order to combat piracy, uh, whether those are our ISPs, technology vendors, the content orders themselves, um, so I can just, you know, agree to my, what my friends just said here. No, I mean, and that, and that's, you know, it's very interesting, right? I mean, it's, when you think about a streaming video workflow, there are companies who really sort of, you know, will pick one provider. It's like, Hey, I can get somebody who does all these things in my workflow and I don't really have to worry about multiple companies uh, or more multiple partners or multiple technologies. But it's interesting with security that it's, it's really you know, it's really you have to go out and find those best of breed solutions and you have to combine them together uh, in order to create, uh, you know, the best possible security strategy or approach, uh, you know, to protect, again, your content, you know, the majority of the time. Um, you know, Orly, one of the things that you had talked a bit about, and you've mentioned this a couple of times, is sort of detect and disrupt, uh, which is a really interesting approach that I had not heard about before. And I, I do sort of love the way that that sounds. And so I, I want to ask you to maybe start us off uh, with an answer to this question, but, you know, in terms of detecting, right? So how is, um, you know, how is stream theft detected? You know, is this a manual process? You know, for example, I've talked to some content owners that, you know, they literally cull through logs in order to determine, you know, anomalies with streaming. So let's say a user that has, you know, way too many sessions for way too long uh, to be a normal viewer. You know, are, uh, do you see that happening or, or can this be, you know, automated, right? Can there be some sort of AI or machine learning or some sort of automated system that can find bad actors and help distributors identify them so that they can, in fact, you know, remove them from, uh, you know, from their access? Mm -hmm. So the, the right solution should be, um, you know, a combination of technology like web crawlers, network analyzers, um, together with human intelligence, um, because there is something that, you know, you cannot replace with a machine or with an algorithm. You know, for example, discovery process of new pirate networks, it often requires personal connection with the pirates, like emails, chats, or even phone calls. Uh, but of course, in order to scale um, and automate, um, we do see that, we do think that machine learning and AI must be part of the process. Um, in order to automate and, and extend the detection. Uh, when it comes to detecting uh, account sharing, um, machine learning is an essential part of the solution because we are relying on behavioral um, analytics and data is almost the only tool, the only source that we can learn from. Um, so by applying machine learning um, algorithms, we can actually learn other patterns of, you know, um, sharing patterns, uh, fraudulent patterns, and so on, and learn from them and extend the learning to to understand more and more about our users and the way they are, they might be abusing the um, the service. Um, so I think for the detection is um, it's a must to automate the process, but not just also for the respond uh, response or for the disruption because. It's, it's good enough that you can detect all those users that may be sharing their credentials, but if you don't have an automated way to, a way to approach to them or to respond to them, then it 
uh, it may cost you quite a great deal to to do this manually so the automation and the learning and should should apply to both the detection part and the uh, response okay and then um you know Pete what are your what are your thoughts you know sort of a what's your approach to identifying or, or how how do you guys you know, advise your clients or talk to them about identifying stream theft. Yeah, no, I I think it's really important to have a, have a, a very data driven approach. Um, I think for years and years and years we've been kind of trying to play whack a mole and, and kind of fight the internet, so to speak. And I think you know, with the with the advent of, of machine learning AI and the in the kind of introduction into the anti piracy world, it's allowed for vendors like Redetto to become much more intelligent uh, driven. So, you know, using machine learning and AI, not only does it create efficiencies, but it, it's an intelligence. It makes the, the system smarter. So you can actually pinpoint, you know, region specific sites. Uh, if a client is airing a, a live sporting event in Poland, you know, you can you really get an understanding of, of what sites you need to be looking at, um, you know, what bad actors, you know, are, are doing what. And I think, you know, this, is kind of revolutionizing the way that we do anti-piracy services because we don't have to do whack-a-mole. We don't have to have people out there, you know, combing through these sites to figure out what sites to cover when you, you can look at your analytics and do it. And, and I believe, you know, greatly in what Orly said that you, it, you can't 100% replace a human being. There's still that intelligence that they're going to bring in just that landscape and, and understanding. Um, so I think it's a two-pronged approach between, you know, using as much technology as you can to have the smartest system that you possibly can um, and kind of supplementing that with, with human intelligence and, and just that human aspect of it. All right, Mar Marvin, what are your, anything to add there? Yeah, so if, if your streaming service has, uh, has any de degree of success that, which uh, you're, you're all hopeful, um, then you're simply not going to be able to scale manual trawling through logs at all um, because it's not just a, a single set of logs or a single set of analytics that you need to look at. It's going to be, you need to look across uh, CDN access logs, across your, uh, your, your streaming insight solution, um, across your heart beating mechanisms, your GRIP service providers data. There's a lot of data that has to be collated and has to be analyzed in order to, uh, to, to, to detect anomalous behavior. Right? And here I'm talking about the, um, about the, the detection of the, the, the theft rather than um, actually um, going up and um, finding um, pirated sites. So um, it, it, will, it, it quickly becomes um, unfeasible to do that um, using purely manual basic um, um, mechanisms. And certainly there's a place for neural networks and, and uh, AI and machine learning uh, approaches to, to e enable you to find those patterns of behavior, um, but again, supported by, by some human intelligence in order to identify the, the sort of patterns that you're looking for. Okay, um, you know, and obviously, that, and that you know, that makes total sense, right? It's the, it. It would seem to me that no matter how intelligent the system becomes, there will always be the need for a set of eyes or multiple sets of eyes looking for you know those patterns that perhaps the algorithm is not trained, not necessarily uh, clever enough to detect, but not trained to detect. So it's almost like there's a constant shepherding of the technologies used to monitor the technologies used to protect the stream. So it's, you know, it's, again, this just speaks to the fact that this is not a simple thing to do, both protecting the content and monitoring, you know, when uh, security may have been breached. Um, you know, Kay, you know, obviously with Char Charter, you know, you guys stream content and you mentioned, obviously, <laughs> you know, uh, some live sports that that, that Charter uh, distributes, which are the Dodgers. And so it, it's very interesting for me, and I'm sure our audience, to understand, especially when it comes to live content like sports, and again, Marvin made the point that, you know, this is something that people steal a lot or look to steal a lot uh, because sports are very, you know, very popular. But what are the impacts of, you know, some of the anti-theft technologies, whether they be DRM or watermarking or, you know, or anything, um, on stream latency, you know, do, you know, are, are, are these technologies applied in real time? Are they applied, you know, before the content is, you know, provided to the distributor? Is it done at the time of encoding? You know, so can you talk a little bit about what you guys see as the impact of these, 
you know, stream protection technologies on the stream experience? Yeah, so so ideally any anti-theft technologies really shouldn't have any impact to the quality of the video nor the customer experience and it really should be seamless to the customers. And so, you know, for, for DRM, you, usually the license get issued when a customer, you know, press, you know, tune to a channel or pr press play on a bot content, that's when the, you know, the license request gets sent out and a response gets sent back and obviously that needs to be optimized to make sure it's the, the shortest uh, response times that you can have. Um, so, so if everything is implemented correctly, there, there really shouldn't be any um, customer impact or, or stream latency per se. Um, and then obviously depending on the technology and, and content type, like for VOD, if we wanted to do watermarking, um, VOD, you can do that ahead of time um, and not have to be real time, but obviously for something like live streaming sports like the Dodgers, then you know there are things that you probably would be doing it in real time. And, and have to be dynamic. Okay, and then so um, you know, let's let Orly. You know, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Do you see you know from the companies that you guys are working with, um, you know, do they have a concern about the application of streaming technologies as it relates to you know latency or you know the delivery experience? Mm -hmm. Of course, um, and and I agree, there shouldn't be any impact. Um, on the latency or, or the, on the user experience. Um, but we need to differentiate, you know, these tools when they are coming to serve um, a certain goal of protecting the content. So, you know, being able dynamically to change parameters, control, for example, whether it's watermark uh, parameters. Um, so if we're talking about, you know, being able to control uh, the visibility of the watermark or, um, you know, when we are uh, um, ingesting the watermark and so on, this, these are very important because we can actually minimize uh, when needed uh, the impact. But it's not just about watermark or uh, DRM. We are aiming actually to uh, also in, in, in products that are more uh, detect and disrupt uh, product, products to allow, um, you know, integration with other systems of the service provider in order to facilitate a response. So we are aiming to um, have, um, you know, seamless integration, um, totally integrate with current workflows of the um, service provider in, in order to allow scalability and automation of, you know, both the detection and the disrupt. Okay, um, you know, Marvin, do you have anything to, to add to that as well? What do you, you know, what do you guys see from, you know, from your client engagements with, with distributors? How are you helping them manage the, impact of security technologies on you know latency and the and the experience yeah absolutely so uh, the first thing that uh, any potential customer asks um, at least when i meet the the product owners and the um, the, the, the 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 stating of the the owners of the of the software and applications is um, will it have any impact on my startups um, metrics or on my video buffering metrics and um, the answer that they always want is none at all. So it's very, it's vital, especially with live live streams uh, and uh, services where people can switch between live content uh, channels and and VOD items very quickly. Um, you know, people have gone through a lot of effort to do things like using uh, scalable licenses to uh, to ensure that 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 Steam start up as quickly as possible, the last thing they want is any any security technology um, having any impact, negative impact on, on the Steam startup. So that's the first thing that people ask for. And, uh, you know, it's it's important that, we're, that you're able to minimize the latency. Not not all solutions um, can offer that. So, you know, um, not all watermarking uh, approaches uh, can offer um, zero impact on, on, on latency, uh, but it's certainly something that our customers demand and, and uh, which we, we feel is very important to, to be Able to offer, like I said, again, especially for 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 live streaming, you know, things like DRM have been around for for a very long time. Um, it's part of the the natural workflow of of streaming services, or at least it should be. Um, so the the impact on on latency on startup um, time for for streams really has been minimized. Um, as, as much as possible, so I don't think that the, that customers really uh, are, are that concerned about that about anything like that. Um, but certainly, when you when you start introducing additional layers like watermarking, it becomes a um, a concern for people. But um, we can assure them that uh, the impact is zero. Sure. And Pete, do you have anything to add there? 
Yeah, no, I think I think the industry has, you know, for all the watermarking vendors has done a great job at really kind of addressing this issue and introducing things like encoder plugins that basically have zero zero, you know, maybe a little bit to zero latency. Um so yeah, I think I think the latency issues has been addressed and I think giving giving distributors options um from a security standpoint is really important so they can kind of do the security versus impact trade off um you know and 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 have that that choice to make um but i think you know like martin was saying i think from a watermarking standpoint uh, the the latency issue has been mostly addressed okay um so now we're going to do a little sort of two things uh first uh, to the audience out there if you do have questions that you want to get answered please um, don't hesitate to put them into uh you know the the, the question area uh, I will try to incorporate them into the discussion or we'll save a little bit of time at the end uh, and have the panelists address them. Um, the second thing is now it's time for a little bit of a shameless plug. And so, you know, if, you know, Kay, you are uh, one of our co-chairs at the Streaming Video Alliance of the Privacy and Protection Working Group. So I'd like just, you know, just for a little bit, if you can talk, you know, how organizations like ours, and there are obviously other organizations tackling both streaming and, uh, you know, and stream security, you know, how are these organizations working to solve some of the technical challenges associated with uh, securing live streams? Yeah, so as, as everyone has alluded, um, you know, on, on the call here on this webinar, is video piracy is a problem that really can be solved by just a single company. It is a problem that all participants of the ecosystem, the industry as a whole, really should jointly tackle because video pirates are very agile where they are very quick to identify the weakest link in the video path and exploit it. Um, so organization like SVA you know, brings together the technical knowledge from the different organizations to raise awareness and share learnings of the latest piracy techniques and threats. And so last year in November, um, as you mentioned, SVA Privacy and Protection Working Group, you know, we hosted a video piracy workshop that we have, you know, multiple participants come in to describe the problem of video piracy, how contents are being stolen, and some of the mitigation strategies that can be applied. And the same working group, you know, um, we are kind of currently working on a paper focusing on streaming security, which can, which will explore the different methods of securing live streams and provide recommendations on best practices. And we're hoping that this will kind of become a, a, a good reference for anybody who who is you know thinking about um, securing their, their video streams. And um, we are hoping to get this paper complete and published hopefully sometime between Q2 and Q3. Oh, that's fantastic. Thanks for that. And obviously, uh, you know, friend NTS or Dedo and Cinemedia, you know, those are all SBA members. And uh, Cinemedia has recently joined, so we're looking forward to them contributing. Uh, you know, with our privacy and protection and other groups. And then uh, Friend MTS and Erdetto were both, uh, you know, they were intrinsically involved in the first privacy and protection paper we published, which was about forensic watermarking. And they are obviously involved in, uh, you know, in the work in that group going forward. So thanks for that, Kay. I appreciate that. Um, the, the next question, you know, maybe Peter, maybe you can start us off with this one. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we keep saying, the you know, if, if somebody's going to break into your house, they're going to break into your house, right? You can put it behind uh, a giant steel wall and somebody will figure out a way to get around the steel wall, right? If somebody's really interested in stealing something, they're going to steal it. Um, you know, maybe not the first attempt, but if we keep giving them uh, attempts, they'll keep trying. And so obviously, technology in this space, in security for content delivery keeps evolving, right? It keeps getting better. Um, and because that's because companies like Friend MTS, Nerdetto, and Cinemedia are constantly innovating and trying to figure out a step ahead of the pirates, you know, where are going to be the vulnerabilities uh, where um, pirate access may happen and content may be stolen. And so, you know, Peter, if you could you talk a little bit maybe about, um, you know, what are some of the technologies and approaches that, you know, that Erdetto sees uh, sort of coming down the pipe, you know, things like, you know, blockchain, is, is that going to be involved in stream security or, um, how about automated content recognition? You know, what what role is that starting to play in, um, you know, in stream theft prevention? So if you could just sort of talk about those a little bit, and then, you know, obviously Marvin and, and Orly can jump in after. Yeah, so um, 
blockchain is, is an interesting um, technology that's coming down. And, and I think, you know, what we're seeing is, is the use case for that is, is a lot of like a trusted network where, where you're able to uh, essentially uh, secure your, your content workflow. Um, and then using blockchain as a ledger to understand, you know, this editor got it, that editor got it. It was sent to this facility for audio layback, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, it, it's, we're, we're starting to see that, you know, integrated with a lot of watermarking technologies to really um, understand the workflow and, you know, what people have touched it and what they've done with it and understanding where a leak might happen, you know, prior to the distribution of that content. Um, you know, if you are a broadcaster and have multiple different, um, you know, RSAs that you're, or, uh, you know, regional uh, sites that you're sending content to, um, and really being able to track that content and understanding, you know, who leaked it, how it leaked, um, you know, how was the security breach. Um, you know, and I think that's kind of one of the, the really interesting things. I think we're seeing companies like IBM um, really kind of build this in the cloud and doing something. They, they have a technology called DATF that we're part of that um, is basically securing the content workflow in the network. And, and blockchain is obviously a huge part of that, um, as well as the cloud. Um, we're seeing, you know, a lot of watermarking um, getting put into the cloud and, and enabling that, that tracking of the content throughout the workflow. And I think these are both technologies that, you know, lend themselves very well to, to cloud technologies and, and kind of adding to the security of any workflow. Marvin, do you have any, uh, what are your thoughts on sort of the technologies coming down the pipe or, or just starting to be used right now? Yeah, so the blockchain is interesting, as uh, as Peter said as well. Um, what what we are really looking for there is um, how well that can be applied to live streaming, um, you know, of of events that haven't been um, pre-recorded. And, and you know, I'll, I'll fall back to the to the example of sports again. Um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how how well that can scale um, for live scenarios and and how. Um, whether or not um, that kind of attribution-based uh, uh, or, or dis distribution uh, distributed ledger-based uh, system um, can work for for large numbers of of users on uh, watching live streams. Um, the other things that uh, that I think um, all of the technology vendors on this call will be uh, will be talking about a lot is uh, credential um, theft and uh, credential sharing. Um, you know that is a, a very hot um, hot button topic um, for. Uh, for the big uh, VOD streamers as well as uh, live um, traditional uh, pay TV operators who have OTT services, so there's going to be a lot of focus on on credential sharing and and uh, credential theft um, as as problem areas, um, especially as we uh, uh, as an industry get better at protecting the content at the source. And we're really, really quickly before Orly, before we jump to you uh, to get your thoughts on this, you know, Marvin, what are what are your thoughts on you know automated content recognition? Is that something that you guys are seeing uh, come into play more in terms of you know preventing stream theft? So, yes, um, that, that that is uh, it's important uh, to be well. You need to be able to find the the needle in the haystack. You know, when um, when you're looking for uh, for uh, for content that's being repeated or that's being rebroadcast, um, but the the issue with with that kind of technology, and we've seen this with. Uh, with the technology, for example, that's embedded in um, in Blu-ray players and in um, in other AV equipment, is that um, they depend on on vendors um, on all vendors implementing the same standards and to the same level of protection. Um, but all you need is a, is a few vendors that um, don't comply to the standards, that don't implement the the, the content recognition um, mechanisms um, for the the system to break down. Um, you know, and and people will simply use uh, whatever whatever uh, tools they can. Can um, that bypass the security mechanisms? Uh, no, that makes that makes total sense. Um, Orly, so what are your thoughts on technology? What are you guys seeing at Cine Media? Mm -hmm. um, so we are investing a lot of effort um, in creating the next gen of anti-piracy anti solutions. Um, we are investing a lot in cybersecurity capabilities. Um, in order to practice both active and proactive defense. Um, I can give you an example. Um, we are focused on mapping and identifying not just, you know, the front end services or streams of the pirate, but also the back end um, and mapping their 
entire supply chain um, in order to hurt them in, in multiple places, different places. For example, um, when we are able to identify or map the entire service of a um, um, pirate, uh, pr pirate uh, services provider, then we are able actually to um, employ tactics like um, IP blocking, for example. Um, so the better technology and better understanding of the pirate services that you have, um, so better response that you can take. So we actually are using sensors or a agent, and it could be, uh, for example, watermark, but not just, also behavior analytics, um, like we do in credential sharing, but we are combining both, um, you know, external sources from the threat landscape as well as internal sources from within the ecosystem of um, our customers in order to to practice both uh, proactive um, and and active defense. Oh, that's very that's very interesting. It almost it almost seems like you know when you get antivirus, right? So they're anti usually the antivirus companies they have uh, kind of a kind of a threat matrix that they update based on all of their clients' input, you know, out in, out in the real world. And it's almost like the streaming video space needs that kind of service for pirates, <laughs> you know, so that, so that in a sense they can almost share information uh, amongst themselves. Again, and, and, you know, coming from where I'm at in the streaming video line, it's all about information sharing. So they could share all that information about the threats that are, you know, coming in to them individually, we'd have one big giant picture and one big giant database that you know potentially everyone could benefit from uh, in terms of uh, in terms of protecting you know original rights uh, and, and content. Um, all right, so we, we've got one last question, uh, and we've got about eight minutes left. Uh, this question, I always like to end with this question because uh, it, it's really sort of you know you guys are all the experts. Uh, it's fun to ask the experts you know what their advice is to people who are looking to implement, um, you know, the technologies or things that are being discussed in the webinar, in this case, uh, you know, security technology. So let's just start with Kay and we'll go down the list to Orly. Um, you know, Kay, what is your sort of one piece of advice about security that you would give to a content owner or video distributor who wants to start to provide live streaming? We lose you, Kay? Are you there? Yeah, I'm on speaking mute. on mute. <laughs> so yeah, um, I, <laughs> I would I would say that like um, content security is complex and it takes time to understand it and get it right. But if we have to just focus on one recommendation, it would be that all content owners and video distributors should be using DRM and implementing it correctly for their streaming distribution. That makes total sense. Marvin, what, what's your what's your piece of advice, your one piece of advice? So if you're a rights holder, pay TV provider, distributor, or a content owner, and you have something that's worth watching, then someone is going to find it worth stealing and worth uh, stealing money from you um, in order to provide their own service. So you need to get the basics right. As Kay said, DRM is the, the very first thing that you need to do. Um, so get the basics right and don't make it easy for people to steal your content. Um, you need to protect the rights, you need to protect your IP, you need to protect the IP of the uh, the content owners um, that you've licensed the content from. Um, so you need you need to actually have a plan to take this, uh, to take the, the problem very seriously. Because it is, if you, like I said, if you have content that's worth watching, then it's going to be worth stealing and people will steal it. Okay, uh, Peter, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I, uh, the piece of advice that I would give is, uh, you know, make sure there's a security strategy in place. Um, you know, oftentimes security is an afterthought. Um, in this case, it needs to be kind of built into the product. You need to have a strong strategy and definitely don't underestimate the impact of piracy on your business. Ah, uh, yes, absolutely. And then uh, finally, Orly, what are your, uh, what do you, what's your advice? Mm -hmm. Um, so my advice would be to focus for for the service provider and content owners to to focus, um, you know, on creating and delivering the best content and and engage with you know experts in order to sell, solve their security issues or you know collaborate uh, with with um, technology providers. And since there is no silver bullet, they should also uh, look to engage with uh, you know 
technology vendors that can provide an umbrella of solution that can you know look at different types of piracy and have in their arsenal different types of uh, you know tools and and weapons to combat piracy and also don't wait to be attacked or you know um, see when wait after the problem um, is happening they should be proactive and 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 start dealing with piracy and and look for you know next gen solution now. No, and actually that that's you know sort of all that's really great advice from everybody uh, but that's i think probably the most important piece of advice is to be proactive and to and to like peter said sort of have a security strategy you know i, I think there is a lot of reactivity uh, that happens because you know ultimately um you know content platforms and distribution platforms and otd services they're 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 trying to get to market quickly they're trying to make you know they're trying to get a return on their investment in content and so sometimes you know things will get shortchanged or overlooked or run past um, only because you know they're focused on that, and so it's. I think it's really important to stop, take a breath, um, and make sure that you've got the right strategy um, in place to be proactive about um, security concerns before they happen, so that the reaction can be more measured, um, you know, and and understand it and 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 understood um, rather than just sort of like, oh my gosh, what's happened? And you know, obviously the house is on fire, and it's a little too late to. Uh, to, you know, to implement some sort of fire safety drill. All right, well, that's that's all we've got today. Um, you know, I just want to say thank you to our panelists. You guys did a great job. It's really uh, a, an amazing amount of information. Uh, I'm going to get this posted onto the website later today. I'm also going to try, actually, to put together a blog post which summarizes what was discussed. So, again, lots of ways that we can share this information with the industry as part of uh, the Streaming Video Alliance's uh, educational objective. We want everybody to be talking, you know, about the same things in the same way. So again, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, really appreciate your time and hope everybody has a wonderful day. Take care, everybody. Thank you.